record right now. So we are officially recording. Um, I like to do all my intros, like my big, big intros at, after the show. That yeah. way I know what we spoke about. Um, but if you're good to go, we're going to get started. Yeah, man. Let's do it. Okay. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Into the Mind. Today, my guest is a very close personal friend, Justin Schaefer. Justin is one of my favorite people for so many reasons. He's the CEO and co-founder of Tranquil Movement. He's the former manager at the Asheville YMCA. He is, I still consider him a professional parkour athlete. He's the host of the podcast, Parkour and More, and he is an absolute GOAT giver. I asked Justin to come on to the show today so that we can talk about our relationship with money, our mindset towards it. And he's around the same age as me, a little bit older, but he's always had such a good head on his shoulders from the time I've met him. We're both a part of the same parkour community. And ultimately, we're working on very similar missions. We want to bring lasting growth and freedom to our community. We want to educate and inspire so we have a passion for people, we have a passion for business, and we clearly see what a lot of individuals in our community have not tapped into yet, which is there's nothing wrong with making money. In fact, it's kind of crucial and important to life. So today I want to spend about an hour talking money, talking mindset, and we'll go behind the scenes on an event that Justin hosted annually, Jump Fest. We'll learn a little bit about what it took to make that happen. We'll talk today about the time he and I spent together in Asheville, what we learned about money there, and we're going to figure out what it is Justin's doing nowadays and how his life has pivoted. So I think this conversation is going to be really powerful for a lot of people because it's coming from two relatively down-to-earth guys who are currently in the middle of building their own future, building our own empire. So we are in the trenches with you all and we have mentors and advisors who have already been there so you're getting a nice perspective from both sides mm -hmm. so justin welcome to the show thank you marlon thank you so much yeah that's uh that's a heck of an intro i appreciate it and uh, very appreciative to be here with you I'm excited to see that you're doing this it's awesome man i'm excited to have you so let's start off with a first question for people who don't already know you mm -hmm. what was jump fest because i think in our community that was one of the kind of staples that you were known for and that was a huge part of our community that's how you and i actually met and became connected so can you explain a little bit about that just give a quick uh recap of what jump fest is if you can even do that quickly yeah 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 the, the hard part's the quick part but yeah it's uh yeah i mean ultimately it was it was one of the largest uh parkour retreats um in the United States. We had over uh, the time of when it was ending, we had close to 300 athletes attending. Um, you know, a lot of them parkour athletes. Others were just inspired by the movement and down with the cause. Uh, ultimately, we ev we asked everyone that was there to help us fundraise for the National Breast Cancer Foundation, and in our eight-year period, we raised over forty thousand dollars for that organization, just doing backflips for bucks. Um, you know, it, it really was a way of kind of captivating that lost boy essence of uh, the parkour community and really trying to show them because I was 21 when I started the event. And so by the time it ended, I was around about I had my 28th birthday, like the week before that last event. Um, and so if people who had attended that whole time really got to see like the maturity of not just me, but of that event grow. Um, and towards the end, it really became this place for if you are conscious during this event, if you are aware, if you're willing to put all the devices down and all of the, the external noise and really just embody what this event is trying to do, you can get a lot out of it. And then others really were just like, I really like this Lost Boy mindset. That's where they resonated and that's where they wanted to stay. But it was cool to see that whole spectrum of like boyhood and manhood of where the parkour community was at at the time. Um, that's not to say that there weren't females there either. They really were. And I think the ones that attended actually probably contributed more to that um, that piece of that cause of really trying to be kind of an education piece or just a stand in for, you know, what kind of men do they want to see in the parkour world as well. So um, I think that was one of the areas that was potentially going to grow even more so, but, you know, thing, things happen. And, uh, but, but ultimately, I, again, I, I think, I think what we set out to do, we, we totally accomplished it. Um, and I think there was, it came to a really good 
completion time where we could have continued it, but I think I had other interests that kind of spoke to me more. Right. I mean, the event was masterfully put together. I was not there in the earliest stages, but I did get in around the midway point. Max Henry would always tell me about it and was telling me I had to go. And it did exactly what you said. It really did capture all ends of the spectrum. And it was nice to see that we can get these young kids there who are still very much maturing and who haven't quite figured out things. And we could get these older men there or, and women who had matured a little bit more. And we can marry the two and show them, guys, getting older and becoming mature doesn't mean necessarily abandoning who you were as a child. It means evolving into who you're going to become and bringing your youth with you, bringing those passions with you and also adopting and learning new things. Because what I really liked about the last few events that you started to hold is you had these panels, panel discussions every morning where it started off as the basic things where the kids were liking, where it's like all, not all movement based panels, but it was heavily movement based. But as you, like you said, as you began to mature, you recognized, Hey guys, an important skill to have besides flipping, besides jumping, besides vaulting. It's also this entrepreneurial business skill, knowing your numbers, knowing your systems, knowing your KPIs. And you started to bring that forward to the stage and introduce that to our community, which was crucial. It's something that we're doing here right now. What I hope to do with this podcast is to bring more of that because you recognize as you're getting there in your own life, how crucial, how important it is to have this knowledge about money, to have these connections, to have these thoughts and to practice these skills because they're just like physical skills. You need to have developed these skills in order to progress. So I was really grateful when you had those panels where you got business owners, where these guys own several gyms to come up. They had international clothing brands to come up. Uh, our time in Asheville, you had a money mindset coach come and speak to us. There were so many things that helped to develop my own mind and my own skill that I was super grateful for. And with Jump Fest, I know that you, you know, you and I have spoken a lot about it, especially like off camera about how much work you put into that, how much work was required to put into it. And those are the behind the scenes that a lot of people never get. So can we talk a little bit about the behind the scenes of putting together an event where you're hosting 300 plus athletes from all around the world for a week in Colorado at a campsite where people are flying in from all over the place, what that looked like um, as far as work put in, money needed to be put in and money earned i know a lot of folks think oh man justin's rolling in the dough now like he's probably buying benzes and lambos and bugattis with all the money he's making off of us and anyone that knows business knows things are never as their pair yeah no yeah, that's that's very astute yeah it's um yeah i mean the work it, it, it it's anything. I, I, my wife and I joke. We say, "Look, life, life is a series of shit sandwiches. Just find the one that's got the least amount of nuts in it." Because it, it really, it's like anything you choose. That whole like, if you find what you, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I mean, it, to a certain extent, I get what they're saying, but it's bullshit. I was like, work is simply just the expenditure of of energy. <laughs> so, are you exercising? You're working. Are you, you know, are you? Do you want to be up till you know midnight? two in the morning queuing up Facebook posts for, you know, the next week to come. No, you, you don't, you'd rather be doing other things. So it's, so when you really break down that work and kind of what it looked like, it said, okay, so year one, right. If we, if we, and I won't go year by year, but if we start in the earlier years, you're looking at everybody, everybody saying no. Okay. So before it was called jump fest, it was called as kind of jokingly, but we, we had a, we had a waterfall, tradition that we had and our the company's name was tranquil movement um, and we knew we wanted ultimately to do something for breast cancer so we came up with the acronym for tit so tit uh, tranquil's initiation tradition so the idea was here's tranquil movements event you're going to come to our initiation with us which is standing under this insane waterfall in manitou springs for a minute um, and then it's going to be a tradition so every year we're going to do it annually so that's really what it started off with. And so when you start approaching, so again, 21 year old kid, I start approaching organizations say, Hey, we're having this event. Are you interested? Can we, can we help 
Now, it's like, I mean, obviously if you're fundraising for somebody, they're going to take the money, but they're like, well, we don't really feel comfortable with the marketing component. We don't really feel good about X, Y, and Z. Um, you start approaching local business owners because how do you keep your costs down? Well, well, let's go local. Let's see if we can't broker out some deals with, you know, getting things from posters made to getting the t-shirts designed to, to all these things. Um, so you're getting doors slammed in your face left and right. And then you realize like, oh, I, I don't have a waiver. I don't know how to make that. So you just start reaching out and you start, you know, it, so it was so much of this big puzzle piece that ultimately it's like the fact that I didn't, I didn't quit after year one really still kind of blows my mind because it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I mean, movement generally came pretty easy for me. So up until that point, yes, there were challenges. Yes, there were things that pushed my comfort zone. But in terms of applying that to the real world, I really hadn't quite, um, you know, navigated through that. And so then around year three, which is when most businesses kind of tank is that was the hardest year. And that was actually, I believe that was the last year. I want to say that was the last year we were officially calling it TIT. That's maybe when we switched it over to Jump Fest. I can't really recall. But year three was so hard um, because at that point it was like the initial venue that we had um, wasn't, you know, they weren't able to help facilitate it anymore. So we had more athletes coming, but we had to cram into this tiny little space. Um, it, for me, it just felt like everything was falling apart. Um, but everyone else who attended said it was one of their fa most favorite years, which was super weird because it was like, for me, I was like, I've totally dropped the ball. This is insane. And that was the year that Gretchen came on board, uh, who was kind of my, my co-founder and co-manager of that event. Um, and without her and without her implementing those systems. So that was, that was that lesson of, okay, if I'm here, here are my strengths as a leader and, and, and at that time, really kind of refusing to acknowledge what my lack of leadership skills, or what my weaknesses were. And Gretchen kind of came in and just witnessed what a lot of those were and said, hey, like what you're bad at is, is, is what I'm an all-star at. And she's like, do you need help? I said, I, yes. And that was the first time professionally I'd ever asked for help um, in that capacity. And from there, it just, it just skyrocketed because I knew, I knew that I could trust her. She knew that she could trust me. Um, and then as we got into the later years, I think what Gretchen and I started to realize is we, we had mastered so many things of our, of our partnership, which is essential when it comes to any business endeavors, finding, finding good people and investing heavily in them. Um, but then the other part was we were growing too quickly. Um, and when we put out the feelers of, okay, what does a volunteering opportunity look like? What does, you know, um, what does it look like to hire some other people to help with this stuff, even if it's just for a week? Um, the reality of it is, is, like in hindsight, I think a lot of people think that they, you know, reached out, and a lot of people, you know, it's like the people that were, the people that were financially compensated during their time at Jump Fest, did their job. They did a fantastic job. They did great. That, that, I mean, everything from the chefs, everything from the housing, everyone did their job. Everything was honored there. It was that next level of saying, hey, who kind of wants to take on this torch? Because as, as Gretchen and I are approaching, we're not the, towards the end, we're getting towards our 30s and we said, okay, look, like we really cannot, it's just, we can't sustain, we don't have that level of energy. I, I can't be doing a week long thing, trying to start a family, you know, 1500 miles away in a different state, trying to organize this event, like something is going to break eventually. Um, and when we put those feelers out, truly, like we really, we really couldn't get people jumping at the bit. Like you'd get some people who'd volunteer and then push comes to shove halfway through the week, they're like, I'm out. And then, you know, when you're putting out those feelers. So it was one of those things where it was like, we were really trying to evolve the parkour community, not just from, you know, kind of philosophical and, and business mindset, but we were really trying to say, okay, like who, who can we, you know, who can we groom or who can we adopt to like kind of help us take over this event so that we could focus our energy on growing the organization and moving elsewhere. Um, so yeah, so that really led us to kind of, I think ultimately, I don't like to use the downfall of Jump Fest because I think the energy is still very much so alive. It's just a, it's kind of like a hurry up and wait situation. Like right. I think eventually the maturity will get there to the point where uh, it, it, it very, I think it very easily could come back. I don't think it would be a lot of effort to do it. It's just about Gretchen and I have vowed we are not doing it alone, which is that simple. So <laughs> I love that. I mean, it, it's, it's actually funny. I think that's like the first time we ever like that question for me has been answered of like kind of the the pause on Jump Fest because I see it as being dormant. I see it as something that could literally be woken up whenever because of how good a job you did at first planting those seeds, tending that garden, putting up a greenhouse around that garden, 
So it doesn't require you to be there ultimately every moment of every day. You did such a good job with the foundation that that foundation is sturdy. It's got another like five, 10 years of unattended sturdiness that it's not going anywhere. It's not being rocked. It's not being shaken. Right. I think it's really, really cool to see that you spoke on something that I wanted to tap into. And it's such a crucial part of business is finding the right people you know, eventually getting to the place, no matter who you are in your business, you are going to grow. You're going to outgrow the one man team, the one woman team. You can't do everything on your own. That's currently has been my own lesson. That's been just getting knocked into my head over and over and over these last few months. And it's so crucial. So when you find a Gretchen, when you find someone that can pick up on your weaknesses, that mm -hmm. is very important and it's in all areas of life not even just business but business it's shown immediately it's shown a little bit more immediately because you have this newborn thing that could potentially fail so if you know that hey reaching out to people is not my thing get somebody that is good with the people skills and good with reaching out if you know implementing systems is not my thing get someone that is good with understanding when we get a new person how do we convey information so that new person knows exactly what they need to do? And we're not spending our entire life training this new person. There's a system in place for them to follow. Like if you go to a McDonald's, if you're not great with the money, go find somebody who that's their jazz. Numbers make sense to them. And they think in numbers all day long where you might think in pictures. That very important. So thank you for speaking on that. It really does help unlock i know for myself personally it helps unlock the bigger image there and for a lot of people they might not recognize that you had so much help after year two after year three to continue to grow jump fast into what it was because i think you would admit this if you did not have that help you would not have been able to scale to that point or scaling to that point would have just ultimately have destroyed you yeah, no, and it, it, it almost did. I think, yeah, 2014 was the, in, even despite having Gretchen's help and having probably one of the easiest planning years, like that was, that was the first time and not the only time, it was the first time that I had full blown panic attack. Just was not, was not sleeping. You know, it was like we finished up a concert uh, at a concert hall, like on a Wednesday night or something. Um, we had the Flowbots there playing to help fundraise with us. Um, so that didn't wrap up until like, you know, midnight or one in the morning. And then we had to stay there to kind of handle up, clean up and get all the kind of bills and checks written out. Um, and then I think at 5 a.m. that next morning, we had to meet with KRDO, which was the morning news to like do a segment about how we were going to be at Acacia Park to do this big, you know, big event for people. Um, and then that that afternoon, we had another thing. Planned. I mean, I so yeah, in the last like 24 hours, I had slept maybe six hours and then just wow. just tanked. Um, so that was, that was really it. I mean, it's like, absolutely. So like I got to experience like that whole step of breaking point where literally it shuts down and it's like, okay, you can't, you can't do this alone. And no one would have guessed that I was even in that weird headspace. They were just like, you know, Justin's just one of the guys, he's having fun. He's out here jumping on a trampoline. I'm like, yeah, why am I not sleeping? Like, it's just like, <laughs> I mean, that's what I love the most is you said that, you know, year three, you thought in your mind it was an absolute shit show that everything went south and oh, yeah. people are still coming and saying like, oh my God, this was amazing. And I think that's why we're doing what we're doing now and having these behind the scenes conversations because on the outside, things always appear to just be so freaking good, so dandy. Like everyone assumes everything is working. It's all perfect. Social media paints this picture. Your brain fills in the blanks and... Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not the truth always, or it's a, a small portion of the truth and they don't get the rest. And ultimately when people are home on their own, trying to recreate something like what you did and they're getting a lot of pushback and they're hitting walls and it's not working out right away. They think something is wrong with them. They're like, well, why can I not do this? Like he made it, like he did it, it looks so easy. It's like. Well, no, here we're finding out like, no, man, like I broke down. I literally was like a ghost in the shell at that point in time for a little bit. And you had to push through that, but people didn't see that battle because that was an internal battle. That was an internal struggle, which ultimately we go through a lot, especially if you're stepping into the entrepreneurial space, you're going to go through it a lot, but in life in general, you're going to go through it a lot. 
So mm-hmm. let me ask you, with something like Jump Fest, right? Now that you know what you do know, you're a little bit older, you're a little bit more mature, how would you go back now and redo those years? If you can go back and give yourself advice that you would listen to, what would that advice look like to yourself in those earlier years? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because I, I really think, I mean, in terms of the process, I really do think it was, it was very organic in the way that the event grew and the way that it fostered my personal development. I wouldn't, I really wouldn't change any of those pieces out. I think, I think a big part of it would definitely be, um, I, I think, yeah, the biggest regrets I have in life in general are the times that I did not, um, I did not just, uh, I didn't speak up when needed, um, in terms of like, yeah, like if it was a bad negotiation deal or things like I kind of just naturally just kind of bit the bullet. Um, I, I think I would have, if I could have flexed, like knowing what value was actually being brought, I think there were certain areas where I could have flexed that muscle a little bit harder. Um, just, just for the betterment of the community. I was like, you know, I think there's, you know, whether it came down to finances or things like there's definitely certain areas I could have, um, yeah, like I said, flex that a little bit. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, I, I think the other piece too is just to really, really kind of drawing out, not drawing out, but like tuning out to all the noise. So like one of the things that you had, you had referenced is that a lot of people look and think, oh, it must be, you know, how is he able to do it? Uh, must, you know, it looks like it's so easy. He must be rolling in the dough, things like that. And then the other end of the spectrum you have, the ones that despite your hardest efforts, despite how many times you reach out, they're just talking shit. And it's like, it's always somewhere in the middle there where it's like, that's where I wish I would have spent more time residing. And like the people that really were not interested in really, you know, instead of like maybe making it about something it wasn't, just really just cutting it off and learning like, okay, there's certain ties that you need to cut, especially when you look at the parkour community and there's, you know, like we have thousands of friends in common on social media sites. It's like, I don't, I don't really know these people. It's like the only thing that bonds us is this movement that we have. But really, when it comes to, when it comes to business, when it comes to what you can actually manage, it's like, really, it's like who's under your roof? Like those, those are the people that, you know, that those are the ones that matter the most ultimately because they're the ones you interact with on a daily basis. The other ones, it's like for that moment of the event, it's like here, you know, here is who I am for you all during this event. And if at any point I'm not embodying that, let me know. Um, and then that, that should be the end of it. If someone is, you know, half a world away and, you know, just saying, well, I think, I think things could be better, but they've never attended the event. It's like, then, you know, right then and there, it's like, okay. Um, yeah. Like how to really make those distinctions between, okay, like what, what is the most important thing and what can I actually impact and what can I change and really just hone on, hone in on that. I mean, that was, that would have been my biggest advice is to not get caught up in, in all of the sides and trying to please everybody. It's like, look, you know, and I think towards the end, I learned that where I said, let me just take care of the people that actually show up because they're, they're, they're the ones that are confiding in me with not only their money, their time, their resources, their energy. Uh, so those are the ones that matter. And those are the ones that still continue to matter. So that's really good advice. And it's funny where every time we talk, like no matter what we try and make the topic, it always really does come back to this mindset of working on yourself, working on having that personal growth and being reflective on yourself because it really is important. Like the advice you just gave is advice that I get from high level mentors who are multimillionaires, self-made businessmen and women who come from the same place of recognizing, bring value to who you can bring value to and forget about everybody else because those aren't the people that you can serve. You're gonna burn yourself out trying to serve them it's like pouring water into a bucket and that bucket has a massive hole in the bottom. You're just wasting the water that you have to pour. Go find somewhere where someone's ready to capture it. They're looking to capture it and you can fill them up because that's ultimately going to be more rewarding and it's going to be more beneficial for both you and them because Mm -hmm. you're not going to get drained out on trying to fill the other person up. They're actually going to get value by you putting something into them and it'll be more sustainable where you can do this again, you can rinse and repeat this process. However, trying to, like you said, please the masses who really, at the end of the day, for all intensive purposes, 
don't matter to the mission, don't matter to what you're trying to build and accomplish. They are just at that point in time taking and wasting your energy and time and you're wasting your energy and time with them. And I think a lot of people, especially people that care, you and I are people that are very connected to other humans. We care a lot. We feel some type of way, a negative type of way about saying, oh, but I don't want to ignore that person or ignore those people. But ultimately, it's a maturing process. You have to learn to ignore people in order to benefit the people that you truly, truly, truly can bring real, actual value to. Mm -hmm. And you did that so well. You brought value, like to myself, I know you brought so much value to me. I know so many other people at Jump Fest that attended felt that you brought so much value. So when it came, you know, at the time, I believe your event was one of the more expensive events. And even it wasn't still that expensive. Was, I think I remembered the last ticket I paid was like 200 bucks or something like that. Yeah. And as far as parkour events, that's pricey. Um, as far as the value we received, and I'm looking back at it, I'm like, wow, that was absolutely nothing. Still is absolutely nothing. Like you could have charged way more. And no one, I don't think anyone would have paid it, gone to the event and then been upset and said, hey, I'm going to refund. It just would not have happened because you provided such value. And that was crucial because you learned to channel and funnel that vision and funnel that message towards your niche, towards the people that you were meant to touch and work with. So yeah. that's really, really awesome. What I do want to, because I do want people to also get a sense of money. So if it's okay with you, you know, can you talk on the expenses that it costs? Like, what did it actually look like putting this event together? I know you said you did a lot of reaching out to organizations and contacting them to get them on board at sponsorship and just collaborating. So with that, like, can you talk a little bit about like if someone's looking to work with a company or work with their local businesses, what they can do. And then also what were the expenses on your end? What did that look like as far as numbers and uh, just time and energy needed to put this on? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So I think the, I mean, the first thing that I'll, I'll address is definitely when the, like that idea, cause I heard it my entire, my entire duration of that event was that the, the ticket prices were too expensive and in comparison to parkour events. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess at the time, yeah, but it's like when I look at, okay, in any other industry, if I want to do a week long, anything, um, yeah, I mean, minimum, <laughs> minimum 500 bucks. Um, you know, so it's like the fact that we were able to pull off that event, uh, for ballpark around $275 a ticket. And that wasn't tor until towards the, the later portion of that. And even if you showed up the day of and we had spots, it was $300 and you could show up. So it was like, and you get a shirt, you get breakfast and dinner every day. You're, you know, granted we're campings, but it's like, but you get to camp with 250 plus people who think just like you. It's like you're in an environment when you want to say, hey, I want to do a flip off that everyone else in your normal world is telling you you're, you're insane, you're crazy. And then you have this whole thriving community. And then we have guest speakers flying in um, from all over the world to just, you know, start your mornings off with some really thoughtful intention. So again, it's like, I don't, I've never felt like I needed to justify it. And in fact, every year when we raised the price, more people showed up. So that's already, that's already piece one. It's like, look, like it's already a niche market. So you know, when, when you're trying to get, and the truth is, is if I'm charging $50 a ticket, I can't, I cannot provide you everything that you want. Cause that's, that will lead into that expense conversation. So I think a lot of people, uh, cause I got a few emails again, no one's ever asked for a refund. So I really think people really did get exactly what you were referencing there in terms of the value of the event once they show up. But I did have a lot of people that I think they just do quick numbers on their calculator. They say, okay, well, how many people attended? All right, there's 250 people. He's charged, you want 275 dollars a ticket. Okay. So he made what ballpark, like 40, $45,000. And then they would just assume that that's how much I made. And they're like, and cause they would always say, wow, you get to write a $45,000 check to the national breast cancer foundation. I was like, <laughs> uh, no, that's not, that's not how that works. So basically what, what we did is the ticket sales, the ticket sales completely funded the operation. So for most of the years, up until we started getting into, you know, end of the year profit margins, 
I would go into whatever it took, thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars in debt, banking and hoping that people would show up. I was like, so that's when what we did like the early bird pricing was like, okay, I priced it where I will, I will personally break even if X amount of people show up. So my goal with the early bird pricing is okay, let's, let's break even from there. That way I'm not nearly as stressed out. The event can happen. And then anything else on top of that just allows us to add more value. So maybe we can do better food. Maybe we can, you know, spend a little bit extra on the t-shirt design. Like, so that, that's when like all those kind of non-fixed expenses came in. Things like insurance, if I wanted to rent the space, I had to put the down deposit on that. Uh, when we were renting the park for two days so that we could bring in obstacles, like all these things, you know, $1,000 here, $2,000 there, $3,000 food, you know, towards the end, food got more and more expensive, but Costco, Costco and a little bit of a lot of elbow grease can get a long way. But ultimately, you know, it's, if you're trying to create this environment of like, we don't just want you to survive this event. We don't want it to be hell on earth. We want it to actually feel like you, you look forward to waking up in the morning and having breakfast and eating. You look forward to dinner because yeah, eating spaghetti every night, it sucks. So it's just these things where it's like, we found that, you know, the more expensive we got and more people that come up, all of your costs start going up exponentially as well. You know, so you kind of have to constantly replay with the budget, but ultimately that those ticket sales help make that event happen. So by the people, like the people essentially really kind of were investors in that event. They just said, yeah, I'm going to put my money. I'm going to support this endeavor. And we're just going to together, we're going to make it happen. I was just the, I just had the fiduciary responsibility or the fiscal financial responsibility to make sure I didn't fuck up with what I did with their money. I was like, let me just actually, okay, here's what they're wanting. Let me just make sure that this money goes to the right people so that what they're envisioning can happen. Um, and then the backflips for bucks were specifically how we raised, um, uh, money for the national breast cancer foundation. So that was by, by the kids going around, all of us going around doing backflips, raising money, $1 here, one flip there. Um, yeah, that's how we ended up raising all that. And then towards the end of the year, I would personally give something, um, the business would personally give something, uh, you know, so that just kind of helped get everything up. And then, um, yeah. And then, you know, so normally it'd be about, I'd start in January, January of, you know, whatever year was when we basically had to start renting facilities or we risk losing them. Um, so January is when I would start the event was in July. So it's six months. I think the best year, um, six months of work, I ended up being able to write myself about $8,000 check, which I think a lot of people, again, are like, Oh my God, that was, you know, that's so awesome. That's such a good take. And I was like, but not when that was my only source of income. So that was for the entire year. You're looking at that. So again, it's just these things where it's like, yeah, would, would anybody like an $8,000 check? Yeah. But it wasn't overnight as a granted, the check did come in one lump sum. So it feels good to, you know, you, you get to reward yourself in that way, but it's like, dude, any job, you can literally work any job and you'll make that per year. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that was it. And then the way I knew, I was like, the only way that we're going to be able to make this grow because we've capped out the size of Colorado, we've capped out our like as much as, as good as Gretchen and I were at penny pinching and, and being very resourceful and finding ways to make things work. It was just getting, it was just getting way out of hand because when you start growing that size, people start looking, you know? So now they're like, okay, well, why, why every year is, you know, 300 people come into this, this private property and campsite. And then they start categorizing as different things. So now you got to get different permits. You know, now you're looking at noise permits. Now you're looking at, you know, well, you know, if it's a private residence, that's not, you know, it's not sanctioned for that. Then you've got to get this new thing to like change the, you know, so it was just this thing where it's getting more and more expensive. And then, and unfortunately, so that might be one of the things I go back to is actually jump fest was not expensive enough, plain and simple. It just wasn't, it wasn't expensive enough because we yeah, eventually got to the point where, you know, renting out the entire facility one year, maybe cost us $1,200. And in order to do it in 2019, if we had chosen to do it, it would have been about $7,000 total is what just, wow. just to have a campsite. So it's just like, you know, you look at those things and you're like, wow, we really shot ourselves in the foot by tailoring to that loud, that loud mouth side of the population that's saying, oh, it's too expensive. It's shit. Da, 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 da. Because we, because we pandered to it. Um, yeah. I mean, ultimately that was kind of a big shoot, you know, shot in the foot, shot in the leg. Um, I mean, that event easily, I mean, should have started at $500 for the week. Like no, no questions. I completely agree with you. Like knowing what I know now, that event was extremely underpriced, not complaining. I'm, I'm happy that we got it 
gifts like at such a discount, but it was completely underpriced and the value was, you know, you promised one thing and you delivered much higher every single time. So thank you for that. And thank you for sharing the back end behind it because there's so much, there's so many lessons. Like honestly, we can dive into just using JumpFest to really dive into so many different lessons, so many different key points of wisdom that you've learned through this process. I am curious to know at any point besides Gretchen, did you ever pull in to your corner a business mentor who was able to help you guide? Because as I'm thinking about what you did there, and recently last week I spoke with uh, the Flight or Fight, Fight or Flight Academy and what they've mm -hmm. been doing. I don't know if you've been seeing what they've been doing with their yeah. masterclass and their competition. You know, like it caught me on social media where I was like, these guys are absolutely up to something and there's a new brain in here. There's a, like, you can just tell, like I was like, there's a business brain in here. I need to figure out who that brain is. So I reached out to them and lo and behold, they have a new guy named Sal who knows nothing about parkour, but he does know business. And it's so evident. So did, at any point in time, you pull in a outside brain or was this all through yourself trial and error, figuring it out as you went? And um, Yeah, I mean, in terms of there being an official person, I mean, it was kind of a collection of people that I was close with. So Gretchen and I have a mutual friend, uh, Wayne Larson, who um, yeah, is the owner of Flip Shack and was just very influential in, in both of our lives of just how you approach business. Um, and yeah, and he's, and he's very calculated, very, um, very conscious, um, and very, and very cautious as well. So the way that he approached business is definitely that of the turtle. Um, and, and, and I think Gretchen and I are more of the, we are the hare. We like to go as fast as possible all the time. Um, but really, I mean, really from like the marketing component and really how we wanted people to, that weren't at the event, how we wanted them to perceive us. I mean, really my wife was very crucial in that. She's, she's phenomenal at the marketing side. Um, and, uh, and because I met her when I was so young, like it really, you know, at that time, um, she had already had a business for probably close to four years, maybe five years. Um, so she had kind of already been, you know, a couple of years ahead of like, here are some of the pitfalls you're about to have. And so she really was able to kind of do that. But yeah, I mean, I think we would have, we would have liked to get to that point. Um, it just, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I, I read constantly. So that was, I mean, that was a lot. So there's a lot of things that I pull inspiration from. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm working out, it's rare that I've got music on. It's usually a podcast of some type of self-development. And I find that I actually like Ironically, I run faster. I perform better when I'm listening to people talk about things that I'm interested in and edu and like they're educational versus like the music. I tend to just my heart rate gets too high and then I burn out too quick. So um, I just I found that interesting a little hack for myself. But um, yeah, but I but absolutely I can see, tell I can see where you're trying to go with like the the business and getting the outside mind. And yes, I advocated for this so heavily because before it was like it's like the model was that was always presented at things like art of retreat or conversations where like, you know, when I showed up my first year to those types of events, uh, I was under the impression that, Oh yeah, we're about to talk money. Cause like I'm used to things like, you know, B and I and different networkers, um, that, uh, really like before the meeting even starts, you are in front of a group of people are you're supposed to, it's, a, it's like, it's what's expected of you is to share basically like, how much you're worth. And in the, in the last, since the last time we met, cause they would meet, you know, these types of events meet weekly. So in from this week to in the last week, like how much money have you made? Um, you know, of us as the group that are, you know, essentially it's referral based have, you know, have we helped fulfill on our promise to you uh, and vice versa? Like, so how much money have you, have we as the network, how many of we, how much money have we helped you raise? And vice versa, how much money and how much referrals have you helped your other people in here? So it's like when you when you start having those types of conversations, it, it just eliminates all those blocks you have because you got to be 100 percent vulnerable. You're like, look, man, I had not bad week. I had bad two weeks. I had bad month. I had bad year. And then, and then these people who care about you because they have a financial interest in your being there say, OK, well, how can we help? Like, who who's your ideal client? Who do you need? So they start asking these questions of like, OK, well, something's missing the way that either you're communicating. Maybe it's the way that you're portraying yourself online. as like, is your entire Facebook feed politics shit? 
Like that's probably, that's probably why people are avoiding you like the plague. So it's, um, you know, not to say that you shouldn't have your opinions, but there's a time and a place for everything. You know, like your LinkedIn, you never see any of that stuff on LinkedIn. It's very to the point resume business stuff. Um, so when I start attending these events and I start kind of approaching it with that mindset, I instantly felt this like, like ostracization of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like why Justin's all about money. That's all he cares about. Why is this all, why does he see parkour with dollar signs and da, da, da. And I was like, why the hell are we here? Like I didn't just buy a ticket to New York. And, and pay for this event to just toot my own horn and talk about how like philosophical I am about the sport. I was like, no, like guys, we got to fix this shit because like, because what we're doing right now is not working. It's clearly not working. And everyone's like, no, it's working. I was like, I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade shoes with any of you. Like I, I wouldn't, none, no, no one in the parkour world, literally no one has given me any example or any inspiration of like, I'm going to do exactly what they did. It was like, no, I was like from the beginning to end, it was always like, I would take maybe some snippets of like, I like what they did there, but I think they're missing the mark here. And I would just, I would tweak it in the way that I thought was better and I would run forward with it. And so that was why I was really excited to be in the room with all these people and say, okay, like, let's see what the vibe is. And at that time, the idea of pulling out an outside mind, someone who did not practice parkour and asking for their advice and getting their financial help and, was so frowned upon. And I was like, I don't, I don't know why I'm sure that evolved. I'm glad it evolved. Hopefully it continues to, because the truth is, is if we keep focusing on just parkour, if it, it's like, you know, for a lot of jobs or careers, you need, you need some type of certification or, uh, you know, certificate from, from a diploma, like you need all these things. Right. And it's like, if, if to enter the parkour world means you must be able to do what? backflip Kong precision. Like if that is the, if that is the barrier that stops you from getting involved in the sport, we're eliminating a huge portion of the population that can actually fucking help like grow the infrastructure. So I was always advocating for it. And I, and like, that's why I, and I even use Gretchen as a reference. She didn't care about parkour at all. It was just her relationship with me. Like she just knew she's like, Justin's my friend. I can see he's struggling. Uh, here's where my strengths are. Let me see if I can help. And then through that, she developed this love and devotion to not only parkour, but to the people. And then like, that's like now, now, now we have more people that are advocating for parkour and she can spread the word in a positive light because we taught her by example, what parkour can provide people. And so, yeah, I mean, what, what the flight or flight are doing is exactly what Noah and I were trying to accomplish with the jump fest online, like literally exactly. Um, and it, and it got some traction, but again, uh, our hardest part there was with, and so I, you know, I, I'm really curious to listen and tune into that podcast because what we discovered and even just watch shark tank for like one season and you'll discover real quickly that things that are social media based platforms eat up so much of your overhead. Like in order for us to get the traction and the sales that we needed, the amount of money that we would have to put into Facebook ads just ate like everything. So it was like, it was just as constantly breaking even. And I was just like, I don't even know how, unless we pull outside money to help us like up level this and you start getting the famous, you know, people on there and they're doing master classes, which is exactly what master class did. So it's like, it's, you know, Oh man, Justin, you just got me so excited and so happy because like this, first off, I got to let you know, you just gave me an idea. So if it turns into a million dollar, billion dollar idea, I, I got you. I'm sharing it with you, which right. is, you know, you're going to listen to that podcast. I did with fight or flight. It's going to actually be the first one because it's a little bit more time sensitive than everyone else's. So although I recorded them later on, I'm going to release them as the first episode on August 3rd. So that's already, if people are listening to this, they've already had a chance to listen to that. And we did speak about the systems that they're putting in place. But after I turned off the camera and we were no longer recording, that's when we went even deeper. And I'm going to start keeping those recordings of those conversations and I'm going to release them to, it's going to be like, you have to almost like buy in to listen to those conversations because those conversations are extremely sensitive to the people's business, to their business model. Those ideas are still, it's intellectual property. And right. the right people listening to it will never screw anyone over, but you release it to the masses. It can now affect the, what they're trying to do. So they mm -hmm. have to be, it's just a part of business. You have to know when you can say something and when you can't. So timing matters. Um, yeah. But ultimately for other business folks who are working, it's been, if they can hear that now and they can implement it into their own business, oh my God, like what it has the power to do 
is unbelievable. So mm -hmm. thank you for like helping me piece that together. Um, of course. You know, and it's cool to see that like you tapped into it. You tapped into it early by bringing Gretchen in, who was not a parkour athlete. You know, like she didn't really care for the movement. I mean, like I think that's something we forget. Like a lot of people in our community forget. Like, hey guys, outside of this community, parkour is relatively meaningless. It's like no one else cares. No one else gives a damn. It's the same way in the parkour community. A lot of us don't watch traditional sports. Like you can talk to us about football, and we genuinely right. don't care. It does not change anything in our life however if you look at those industries they all pull from around and outside of them and the best of them are able to pull people that like the owners of the basketball teams don't necessarily play, play basketball the owners of the football team don't necessarily play football people within the parkour community we can tap into that same sort of concept and we can collaborate with these folks and it would give us a competitive edge it would stop us from being swallowed up by every other living business out there that's constantly growing and we're like little organisms in a microbiome and you know like the little cells come and start to gobble up the smaller ones around them right now yeah. parkour is still this little tiny cell and it's about to be released into the world and or it already is released into the world and there are other bigger things kind of approaching it and they're not looking at us as friend they're looking at us as food and if yeah. we don't get bigger sooner we will be gobbled up, we will be eaten. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, they're just doing their job. They're just surviving, they're just growing. It's kind of like, shame on us for not doing the same. So, you know, it starts off independently and I'm happy that you have that mindset. I know I'm grateful I have that mindset. You're someone that helped me see that it's possible to be a part of this community, to still carry this mindset and to still, grow with it and not necessarily run away from the community but at the same time when pull back when it's needed and you're not going to lose the respect of the community you're yeah. focusing on yourself and ultimately you're able to better serve your community by pulling back and focusing on yourself so with that i do want to pivot from jump fest because we could talk about that forever yeah, yeah. and yeah. i don't want us to get lost in there too much yeah. uh, but I do quickly actually want to tap into a conversation that we had. We had it on your podcast when we did episode one. We spoke about it when we were in Asheville, when we um, spoke money. I keep forgetting our coach's name, the coach that you brought to us, because she was wonderful. Yeah. And she, Emma, Emma Churchman. Emma Churchman. Emma Churchman was absolutely fantastic. She came, she sat down with us and really helped unlock our mindset with money and you said something that was so crucial you reminded me about how our relationship and habits with money are built into us by the age of four we have now learned pretty much everything we're going to know about money we learned how we're going to work with money and at that point going forward you're either running with that programming or you're trying to reprogram yourself to have a better programming so yeah. you know can you talk a little bit about the takeaway that you got from Emma while we were out there in Asheville and we could kind of riff on that for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, money's money. So it is so huge. And I just like, I guess, I guess what I would preface with like, if you, the one relationship that you hundred percent must foster and must keep it a healthy relationship is with money. Um, Cause from, from the business lens, from just personal development, from, sitting down and having a beer or a cocktail and just like helping, you know, help, like helping elevate the conversation of what people can do to better set themselves up for the future. Like if you don't have a healthy relationship with money, um, like you're literally like, to me, you're like one of the most annoying people to talk to. Cause it's like, it's like, it's like some, it's like we're trying to contribute to each other, whether it's financial, whether it's just like, no, there's really like, I can see exactly what steps you're taking. And I was like, dude, if you just pivot one step over, like you're talking exponential growth in a whole different area that you you're just neglecting. So I was like, you know, and I don't know, to coin a new term, I guess it's like, you just have wealth fragility. <laughs> like You're just fragile around that conversation. Like take a deep look at that. Cause it's like, I'm telling like the science backs that by, by the time you were age four, two things are happening for sure. One is your concept around money. And two is your social skills. If you do not treat it, if you don't teach a child and introduce them to social environments, 
by the time they're age four, if they're antisocial and shy and, and we're like, that's basically who they're going to be for the rest of their life. So it's just like this idea of like, like, you know, the isolation and like, I don't know, money is the root of all evil. It's like those two things are just like, you're not it even trickles down to where even the future humans that we raise up and bring into this world just have a negative relationship. And if you don't understand money, if you don't understand how it works, then yeah, then like that, like dude, my wife and I just watched the Jeffrey Epstein filthy rich thing on Netflix. Why, why is a 14 year old girl willing to do what happened in, in any capacity for like, they were talking about 200 bucks. I was like, see, that's the type of conversation. Like kids need to be having those conversations and understand like people will use it. If you don't understand how it works, if you don't understand why it exists, if you don't understand you know, what, what does $200 actually equate to? Like what other chores could they have been doing? Like if they mowed the lawn, like, you know, if lemonade stands, like teach them how, how this works, how expenditure of energy manifests into these IOUs. And the next thing, you know, it's like you have people who can be way more privy to when someone's trying to take advantage of, of, of that, of their situation. Um, you know, and I, and I hear it all the time, you know, especially in the parkour world where it's just like, this idea of, of money just being this bad thing. And they come after me like, Justin, like money's not the only thing that matters. I'm like, no shit. I was like, the, the, the main thing that matters is like nothing matters more to me than again, the people under my roof, my wife and my and my kid who's going to be here in October. I was like, I, I, I was like everything other than that is on the side. It's like, but the thing is, is like my wife and I both have a very healthy relationship and a very under a healthy understanding of money so that we, whenever we make decisions, they're in sync. It's not like I'm battling with my wife because, you know, she spends too much on this and I spend too much on that. No, we have it budgeted. We know. I was like, we're in a position where if my wife says, oh my God, I really want those earrings. I can comfortably say, buy them, buy them. Like whatever other hangups you have about it, like buy them, reward yourself. We, you work your ass off. You're worthy of it. And here, I'm buy them for you. So it's just like, it's, it's like when you, when you can create that freedom of like, and really establish like, okay, money's not the problem. If you want to get into the conversation of ethics and all those things. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, I don't know, learn, learning who, learning who you can trust, learning who you can work with that the first conversation that needs to be had before you start diving into business relationships is like, what does this person I'm interacting with, what do they think? What do they feel about money? Because there's going to come a time where money is the main factor of this decision that's happening, whether it's like, you know, you're getting a new investor da, da, da. and if they don't have a healthy relationship with it, and if you don't have an established what that relationship looks like, you're going to have a whole nother shit storm that comes from the left side, right side and just hits you. So I'm like, just really deep dive into that. And like, you know, were your parents bad with money? I had examples of that. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I've totally gotten to see that. But instead of taking them out of my own and just assuming like, oh yeah, like, you know, my parents always fought about money. So I understand money's a really, it's a really scary thing. And no, no, no. So, you know, it's like, is it though? Cause it's like, I, you know, it's like Jeff Bezos can make six, $16 billion in a day. And every meme I'm seeing is like people hating on him for it. And I'm like, I was like, dude, it's like, to a certain extent, you got to be like, dude, that it's pretty inspiring that he's able to do that. And it's like, and people are like, well, he should like give money to X, Y, and Z. And I was like, but he doesn't have to. I was like, and that's, that's the reality of it. It's like, he doesn't have to, if he chooses to awesome, it's very philanthropic of him, but does he have to? No. I mean, the system's set up in a certain way where it's like, they just, they don't, you know? And it's like, and, and, and people are like, well, the 1% keeps getting richer. I was like, duh. I was like, if I give you a hundred bucks and say, okay, I want you to turn this into a thousand dollars, you are going to be working your ass off to make that happen. But if I give you a hundred thousand dollars and said, I want you to turn this into 150, $200,000, $300,000, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. If you, if you show up to the party with a hundred thousand dollars cash, people are taking you seriously. They say, okay. And then now you don't have to go through all those tiny hurdles of penny pinching and, and figuring out all the things out. Like you now have this capital. So like, that's the thing is like, okay. If we're looking at capital, those, that's, you know, assets, things that while you are sleeping, they are making money. The internet is beautiful for this. It's like for Jump Fest, I would set a, a different tone 
for every time a ticket sale would go. So whether I was at a business, you know, a lunch, a dinner, hanging out with family, whatever it was, as soon as I heard that tone go off, I knew, hey, money's in the account, awesome. So I get that little tiny bit of like, okay, cool. My efforts for today are working. Um, and so like, so that's, I mean, yeah, starting up that online business, you know, I think a lot of people have gone the clothing route because it, it's really easy to get it, to really get it started up. It's just, about where do you want to take that? But if you're in a position where you don't have capital, instead of saying I'm mad because I don't have capital and I don't have the cash in order to like make the things I want happen, then, then you're really looking at the idea of leverage. Okay. So how do I, how do I get in with those people that have the capital and the, uh, and the, and the money that can help me make this happen. And and how do I show them that my skill set, my expertise, whether it's in parkour is actually going to provide value to them. And I can tell you almost every meeting I've been to where the, my, the leverage I have is the fact that I can do a backflip and I'm really, really talented at sticking precisions. It, it's never meant shit. No one cares because there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of other people who can do it just as well as I can. But now when I show up and I say, hey, I have, I have eight years of experience of this event that I orchestrated along with these other skill sets, they go, wow, you know what? You've got something. There's something about you. There's something about your look. There's something about your abilities. Like you've got that cool factor because you can do something that's unattainable. So now it's like, you know, that thing that people hate in the parkour world, like do a backflip. I'm like, dude, Noah talks about, no Mittman talks about this. I talk about this. Doing those backflip at a business meeting, whether someone's asked or not asked is like, like it, people, it just blows their mind because they're just like, when when you do a backflip in front of people, some people may see it as like dance monkey dance, but people who are educated, people who are smart, people who are disciplined in other areas, they see the backflip, they see the expertise in the movement, and they go, "That's a disciplined motherfucker," and that and that's what they dive into, and they say, "Okay, he obviously has discipline. It's like he's healthy enough to do these maneuvers. So it means he's got something." If you have other credentials like a degree or whatever and you're trying to go into a specific field that's another layer of that leverage that you've now got um and in fact in order to get that degree a lot of times you got to go on the opposite side of of assets in, in in game now you're in debt so it's like so you really like you once you have those things it, it's not like you graduate college and oh here here's your here's your wealth that you're you you deserve so much it's like no now you've got to use those things and you've got to leverage yourself up whether you go the corporate ladder route or whether you say, okay, I'm going to be entrepreneur. I'm going to do my own thing. But ultimately you, you have to, you have to find, uh, you have to find the people that have this, not just the skill sets, but also the capital, the assets that can help you get to where you're going to go. And you gotta, you gotta show them like that you are willing to put skin in the game. If you don't have, if you're like, well, like, you know, I, we're going to use your money to make my vision happen and that's it. And it's like, well, it's not how that works. Like it's, it's an extreme give and take with all of it. So I guess to kind of wrap back around, it's like develop the relationship with money because it's like no one, no one's pitying you anymore. Like, no, like, do you not have it? That sucks. I think we've all been there. It's like, we've all been there. Am I at a position where like, do I have, you know, do I have enough to be comfortable? Yeah. Could I get, could I be in this position forever currently in my life situation? Yeah, like because we know how to budget, we know how to maneuver around. But the truth is, is like, I don't know. Like my wife and I, we just get bored. We get bored if we stay stagnant for too long. So it turns into like, okay, well, what what can we do next? So, but in so in my household, we've got uh, we've got a real estate agent. This is between two people: a real estate agent, a professional photographer for the last like twelve plus years, a professional parkour athlete. Um, who has very, very specific knowledge when it comes to management and development of systems, as well as an insurance agent certificate. So I'm like, those are five revenue streams that we have um, that are constantly just, just going all the time. And it's like, you know, maybe we sell one house a year. Okay, cool. Well, that's whatever. That's, you know, that's seven grand that we didn't have before. So it's just like, it's these things where it's like, when you get these specific knowledge, when you get these degrees, it's like, you just keep, going and it's like and and word of mouth is the biggest thing it's like the, the the more work that you show up the more integrity you have the more that you're willing to declare and be a stand-in for people you'll be blown away at how quickly it reciprocates back it's the giver's gain idea even even in the bible it talks about how 
to those who have not, you know, more will be taken to those who have more will be given. It's like, it's so true. It's because you have, it's like you have, you have accountability. No one wants to trust an asshole. No one wants to trust the used car salesman. They want, they want to know who is this person that I'm developing this relationship with? Will they take care of me? It's like, so when you look at that, it's like, all, all the money is, is society's way of saying, hey, here's some IOUs for the energy, for the participation in my life and my experience, for the service that you have provided me, for the up leveling you have done for me and my family. Like that's what, that's all that money is. And when you make it something more than that, it's like, dude, you're, it's like, you're wasting your time. It's not, it's like, there's no good. There's no bad. It's simply just a green thing that's easy to carry around. And in fact, now it's just digital numbers on a screen. Like, you no, know, who's carrying around cash all the time? It's like, just, I don't know, man. I, I hope, I hope I'm answering. Oh my some God, questions. dude. No, you like, um, thank you. I'm happy that you, you kind of got into that flow state and you touched on everything you did because everything you said really resonates, really hits home. And if people were listening, like I want them to go back and re-listen to that, everything that you just said, I want them to listen to it again. Because you, I wrote down a few things as you were going, which is one, people having that wealth fragility, which is like, it's true. Like if you're afraid to have this conversation, if you can't have this conversation, if the conversation makes you uneasy, that's a sign that maybe you should be having the conversation because it's an important part of your life. So build up yourself for that. Having a budget is so crucial. It's a lot of fun personally. I like, I think budgets are awesome. Like I got crazy obsessed with budgeting very early on like I was like oh my god like it's so cool it's like you're playing a video game with your life as far as you know what you can and can't do comfortably so now when you spend money there's no feeling of regret or second guessing should I have spent that you know very objectively I'm allowed to spend this money or it's not a subjective feeling like oh maybe I shouldn't have done that like no you're good you're fine it's in your budget you already accounted for it in the past and then when you said you, if people don't know how to talk about money or don't have a relationship with money, I think this was really crucial. Like for me, this like, cause I agree when you ask people, Hey, like if we're going to be in business together and, um, I, we earn a thousand dollars in a single day and you know, how do we want to split that? And they're like, Oh, well, no, it doesn't really matter to me. I hate that answer. It does fucking matter. It really does matter. Like Get serious. Tell me, do you want to do a 50-50? Do you feel like you contributed more work? Do you want to do a 70-30? Like, but you need to have an opinion on it because that eh, it doesn't really matter opinion. That tells me that you're not going to voice your true opinion. You haven't thought about money seriously yet and that you're not going to be the person I need you to be. Like, I need you to have a defined stance that way. And I don't yeah. care what your defined stance is. Like, If you say, hey, I want 90-10, if I feel you're contributing that much to this, then yeah, I will do a 90, 10 with you all day long because you're ultimately providing a value that I can't provide. You're helping to create something I can't create alone. So I'd rather take a little bit of something than a whole lot of nothing, but ultimately being able to have that conversation. And a lot of the people we still work with, they come from that place of like, oh, well, you know, like it doesn't really matter yet. Like it, it does matter. It truly, if it didn't matter, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. The people that we're able to sit in rooms with and connect with and network with, it matters to them as well. And you see it, they're good people, but ultimately it's something that you have to figure out. And the fact that you said money is symbolic, you know, like little green paper bills. Now it's numbers on this. It's all a symbol of how much value you are transferring and putting back into the marketplace, into the community, because if you're not doing the right thing, like that's what I think a lot of people fail to appreciate is, and maybe it's through social media and through movies and things like that. They're like, oh, well, the only way to get rich is to be a crook. And it's like, no, that's one way to get rich. And usually the riches don't last very long. And it's also a one area of your life gets rich and the rest of your areas of your life really get beat up and bad because you don't have a social life. People don't want to be around you. You're around negativity all the time. You got to constantly look over your shoulder. And the other realm, the positive side, the way to get rich is to provide more value to people. The more value you provide, 
the more of that green comes back to you because money is an energy. It's an energetic thing. You know, yeah. so it's like you're going to attract that energy towards you by putting out and giving that energy first, which is that value. Because all it is, is money, by definition, true money, not currency, but money is just a store of value, a store of energy and a store of value. So by putting it out, you get it to come back in. So I think you did an excellent job of tapping into that. And what I want to do is actually, I want to start to wrap it up just because I do have a time frame and I want to keep this at the hour, but we can yeah. talk on this. Like I actually want to do a part two with you where we come back and we touch on it a little bit more. But what I want to ask you, I have two questions that I like to ask people at the end of every show, at the end of every episode. Question one is what is your favorite book or one of your favorite books? And it could be a business book. It could be a financial book. It could be a fiction book or a nonfiction book. It could be a self-development book, but What's a book that you have found a ton of value in and it's just like immediately pops to the top of your head? Mm, that's a good one. Um, I mean, in, in the interest of the kind of the conversation that we're having around the money, um, yeah, wow. Um, I mean, I really, I really did. I like the cynical approach and that very matter of fact kind of. So I can never remember his name because it's, it's the man of two first names. It's, I, I think it's Felix Dennis, I think is his name. He's the guy who created uh, Ultimate Creative Maxim magazine, but initially got his wealth from, uh, he was doing a biography piece on um, Bruce Lee. Um, and everyone thought he was crazy. Like, why are you doing that? And he's broke as a joke. And then like a week before it gets published, Bruce Lee actually dies. So they fly out there. They spend all their money to go fly out there and get the scoop from the, you know, from the family and things. And then they published the book and it like took off. Um, but yeah, it's called how to get rich. And, you know, in there, it's very to the point, like he talks about like his asset, uh, accumulation and, and like the cash value. And he's, you know, it's something along the lines, like if you have like, he considers having five hundred thousand dollars on you in cash assets is comfortably poor. Is how he refers to it. Uh, so like, yeah, he's ma amassed a lot of wealth, but very, I mean, very cynical and in, in, in a good way, where it's like it really does allow you to have those conversations with yourself. Of, you know, there's a chapter about in there about talking about be prepared to lose friends, and and I think that's a huge hang up that people have. And the truth is, is like, what what does friendship mean to you? Um, you know, like I would consider you and I very close friends, but we're not Netflix and, and chilling. We're not, we're not, you know, like we're not just like chilling out at the bars every night together, but it's like, but we know that when we pick up the phone or the, you know, the, the zoom that we're going to pick up right where we left off, you know, and in, and in the time between it's little check-ins here and there. It's like, that's, that's friendship is like, it's the people that it just feels natural with. If, if your idea of friendship is like, yeah, no, we spend six hours a day just by the pool, drinking Mai Tais and, and hanging out. Yeah. If, if, if the goal is to accumulate wealth and, and to up level your life, you just, it's not an efficient use of time. It's just not effective. So he really dives into that. And, uh, and that's just one of the many areas that he talks about, but definitely like how to, how to, how to develop those relationships with people. One of his big tactics is he would create a magazine that would steal enough of the subscription base from a bigger magazine until they bought them out. So, wow, that's smart. Yeah. That's a cool back there. I like it. Yeah. So that's cool. I, that one. I might reread that one actually. I'm kind of inspired to dive back into it. Yeah, man. You, uh, you make me want to pick it up. Felix Dennis, How to Get Rich. Mm -hmm. All right. So, first off, thank you for the book recommendation. I definitely like the cynical parts as well. Uh, I'm reading The Creature of Jekyll Island. I don't know if you picked that up yet, but it is. I haven't picked it up. No, but I've, I've heard of it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's, a, it's a nice one. Like, it's one where you're like, oh my. God, like I see how everything came together. Um, but it's definitely not for the faint to read. Um, what I want to now ask you one of my favorite, favorite questions. Okay. So let's say tomorrow morning you wake up and you have no memories of who you were, who you are. You don't remember anything about Jump Fest. You don't remember any of the experiences you've had. 
you just are a complete blank slate. You're just here. You can still speak English. You have a sense of like, all right, I'm in a safe place, but you just, you don't remember your network. You don't remember your family, friends, nothing. It's just a new person on this planet. Mm -hmm. However, you do get to keep one bit of wisdom that you have currently. Like there's going to be one thought in your head that you're going to know for certain to be true and you're never going to question it. You're not going to be able to necessarily explain why you know it's true. You just have complete faith in this thought and you run with it. What would you want that thought to be? Hmm. Dude, honestly, like, so I wake up in the morning, yeah? Uh-huh. Okay. So I, I wake up in the morning. If I could keep one piece, it would be, I may not, I may not know, I may not know who this, this woman next to me is but just kiss her because I'm telling you like, yeah, I mean, I, I have no doubt that with that one, I mean, yeah, in, in any hypothetical, that one kiss with my wife would instantly bring back all of it. Like she, <laughs> she, she's, she is the glue that holds all of this together. Um, yeah, she's, yeah. So that would, that would really be it. And um, maybe not as profound as you had thought, but I think just her, her and I's story, I, I swear it goes back lifetimes. So it's, you know, it's, I know, I know as soon as that her and I have that intimate kiss, it's going to be boom. The, the same fireworks I experienced before, which, which really kickstarted all of this. I mean, without meeting her, I'd, I'd just, I don't even know where I'd be. So that would be the, that would be the one piece. Dang, Justin, that has to be one of the coolest answers I've gotten yet. That is absolutely now one of – that's up there. I think that's that might be number one right now. That's holding the number one position, and I think it's going to be in the top <laughs> five for a very long time, if not forever. Well, good. Yeah. I, mean, I, I could be proud of that. And, yeah, and it really – I mean, yeah. I mean, it's another valuable lesson there is, like, uh, and not, not, that, not that hot, sexy love, but that, uh, but that long – committed beautiful love uh yeah str strive for it find it wherever you can i agree it. It, it definitely is something that is worth cultivating and worth growing it, it's it's a beautiful thing when you when you grow it and man i'm excited now i'm excited to see your marriage grow i'm excited to see you become a father and just watch that journey and hopefully be a part of that journey yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're always, I mean, yeah, you're always welcome at ours anytime. And um, yeah, if you want to get out of New York for a bit, come back to the mountains, let us know. Absolutely. Justin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us, your wisdom and just your overall good vibes. If people want to follow you, where can they find you? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I have I have a uh, love hate relationship with social media, and I do stints of just getting the hell out of that world. But um, I think right now the, the main the main consistent thing is definitely uh, the podcast parkour and more. Um, you can find it just about anywhere Spotify, Apple, you know, anywhere you enjoy. Um, that's that's kind of my weekly contribution to um, the internet world, if you will. But otherwise, currently uh, Facebook, Instagram. I was lucky enough to just get the handle Justin Schaefer on pretty much every platform. So uh, that's uh, Schaefer kind of like Shea Butter, S-H-E-A-F-F-E-R. <laughs> and I'll put the link down below so that you guys can find him very easily. So again, Justin, thank you so much for coming on and have a great rest of your day, man. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate it.